Welcome to episode 18 of the Between Two Beers podcast. Tonight, we talk to Jeremy Brocky. Shay, who is Jeremy Brocky? Well, he's probably the most high-profile guest that we've had so far. You only have to Google his name to find a pretty impressive highlights reel. Started off in Nelson, um, played some National League for, for Canterbury United a couple of times, but got his big break with the New Zealand Knights in the A-League when it started. Moved across to FC Bling, Sydney FC. Didn't really work out, came back to New Zealand, um, had a pretty successful under-20 and Olympic campaign before he really made um, an A-League career for himself. He was based up at North Queensland Fury in Townsville, where he met his wife, Jess, moved down to Newcastle before coming back home um, and applying his trade for the Wellington Phoenix for a long time. Um, was part of the New Zealand team that travelled to South Africa in um, 2010 for the World Cup and is actually now back in South Africa playing his club football there and um, has earned himself a pretty decent social media following while he's been there, Steve. Yeah, he has. He's big time. Jeremy Brocky is big time. Um, and he's had an incredible career. We talk about his time playing with Robbie Fowler at North Queensland. He talks about Dwight York at Sydney FC, uh, training with Usain Bolt in South Africa. Um, and we get into a deeper layer too. He's got three young kids. His, um, his wife was a surrogate. Uh, it's tough times at the moment during the COVID lockdown. Uh, his family is in Australia and he's, uh, well, with Dan Morgan um, in South Africa by himself. So a lot of time to reflect on a pretty incredible career and um, a really enjoyable chat. Um, this is obviously a video podcast. You're listening on this now, but you can also listen uh, traditional means, uh, Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Uh, special mention, we had an anonymous donor this week. Um, shout out to Brendan, just uses one name, much like Ronaldo, um, and sent a little contribution, said it enjoys the podcast and keep up the good work. So I hope you enjoy this one, Brendan, and hope you enjoy this uh, rest of the audience out there. Jeremy Brocky, welcome to Between Two Beers. How's it going, guys? Very well, very well. We're, we're coming to you from Hamilton. Uh, you're over the other side of the world. Um, why don't you give us just a, a brief uh, picture of exactly what your situation is regarding COVID and lockdown and who you're with and, and what you're doing? Yeah, so uh, we've been in lockdown here now for coming up close to four weeks. Uh, the original lockdown period was meant to be three weeks uh, the, the president came on two weeks into it and said look we're, we're extending the lockdown um, the, the numbers are, are slowly rising uh, we're extending it for another two weeks so that'll be five weeks in total at the end of April um, but the numbers in the last two three days have spiked gradually um, and we're hitting like 250 new cases a day so I I think probably in three or four or five days time, the president's going to come back on again and say, uh, stay in your houses. We're in complete lockdown, um, so we're not allowed to leave our property unless that is for to go to the supermarket, um, to go to the pharmacy, essential things like that. But we can't even go and run around the streets. I think New Zealand's a little bit easier um, from, from that point of view. But uh, I'm living currently with another fellow New Zealander. Dan Morgan, uh -huh. uh, my, my Marisburg teammate, my, me and my family, made, we made a decision um, before the lockdown kicked in for them to, to head back to Australia to my wife's parents' place. Uh, we, we thought it was going to be a lot safer for them to be back there. Um, we just really didn't know how Africa and, and South Africa in general were going to react um, to, to a nationwide lockdown. And so far, it's been, it's been pretty good, um, but you just never know, like, there's a lot of rural, rural areas here that the townships and stuff that are that are not obviously in the same position as um, a lot of South Africa. So mm. uh, it's, it's been difficult being away from the family for five weeks so far, but my, my Kiwi teammate is keeping me company. Very good. Um, we'll, we'll get into a lot of the family stuff because there's a lot of interesting stuff there to talk about. Um, it feels a bit weird and somber, really, having to start all these episodes with international guests hearing about what their perspective is on this incredibly weird, stressful at times time in our lives. But we can crack straight into some uh, more upbeat material. So, Shay, why don't you get us started? How do you know Jeremy Brocky? Um, I think probably like most, burst on the scene as a 18-year-old dreadlocked uh, striker for the New Zealand Knights. Um, <laughs> back, in, back into that first season, I think scored a few goals. Um, 
And then again, through my Oceania work, came across um, Jeremy and various, um, well, in the EA age group teams, under 20s, under 23s. And then when I worked at New Zealand Football, I was lucky enough to go on a couple of tours. Um, Jeremy was on as well. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, really good guy. Um, as, I've, as I've worked out through kind of doing some research, probably a little bit more um, prominent than I might have realized. Um, and maybe our most high profile guest so far, Steve. But how, how well do you, I think you guys are around the same age. Is that kind of, is that fair? Yeah, same, same ballpark. Um, I don't actually know. I don't think I've ever actually met Jeremy. We, we sort of mixed in similar footballing circles growing up. Uh, I remember seeing a few old photos of um, him and Cole Tinkler and the Matthews brothers and the Hogg brothers all going to a 50 cent concert together. Um, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> so, maybe we'll post knowledge. that one in the, in the show notes. But we mixed around, like I said, similar age, similar groups of friends. Um, but yeah, I don't think we ever actually crossed paths, probably because your professional football career took off and you have spent the last 15 years uh, around the world playing football um but yeah excited for tonight like like shay said incredibly high profile guest um yeah honored that you found the time to actually uh talk some shit with us um i'm, shay, not, sure I'm, I'm not sure i'm more high profile than roland jeffrey am i god <laughs> good let's see let's see what the audience is <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll get into your social media following soon but shay where, where are we um where are we where are we kicking off tonight um, well, I, I wanted to go right back to early days of, um, of Jeremy's career. It's 2007, and we're at the OFC under-20 qualifiers. So the, the winner of that tournament goes to um, Canada, I think it was, for the um, for the World Cup. Fiji and the Solomons were probably New Zealand's biggest threat. I think New Zealand put um, the Solomons away early, but then there was a, a pretty, a pretty well-supported game out at um, the old Trusts Arena, and it was before... The grandstand and everything was built like it is now. It was the old concrete steps. And um, the dressing rooms were in the main indoor area. And it was a pretty it was a pretty testy match. And I was what they call the the match coordinator. So I was there working for OFC and my job was to kind of make sure that the match operations went smooth and everything was okay. And um, there's a few incidents in the first half. And then I was walking back up towards the dressing rooms and Jacob Spoonley um pokes his head out of the of the the doors and sort of like gesticulating and screaming at me that i need i need to get up here now because a fight had broken out and i by the time i got there things had simmered but i'd i'd be really interested in in jeremy's recollection of whether there was a fight and how did that kind of how did that actually happen because at the end of the game we had to get police in and the referees had to be escorted it was a debacle but take us into the dressing room and kind of what happened in their jeez yeah, I remember that like it was yesterday. Um, yeah, I think we got given a penalty just before half time, and and before the game, obviously there was only one team that went to the World Cup. Um, like you say, we beat the Solomons early. I think Fiji had the Solomons later, but they were, they were bound to beat them as well. So it was pretty much a final within the tournament, um, the, the tournament setup, and uh, we got given a penalty just before half time. The Fijian boys obviously weren't happy about it. Probably typical um, island refereeing going on there. <laughs> but, um, oh. <laughs> yeah. James scored the um, scored the penalty, and there was a bit of pushing and shoving after he scored the penalty, and that was right on halftime. And like you say, there's the big walk from the from the ground up until the change rooms, and and we thought of, sort of thought let's let's um, get a little bit of a jog onto the change room, get in the change room, and. And then settle down a little bit. So we jogged probably halfway up those the, the concrete path, and then all of a sudden we we turn around. We hear the, the studs of of the Fijian boys running as well, and we go, "Oh, here we go!" And it didn't really start until we got inside the in, inside the door, and there was just pushing and shoving going on, punches being thrown. Um, I remember the the Fijian assistant coach had, like had me in a headlock, boxes. <laughs> <laughs> Boxing players, front teeth out. It was it was all on, and then like I say, probably Seamus came to the rescue. The big, um, I don't think so. Yeah, no, there was a lot of pushing and shoving, and then it sort of um, died down after that. Chain room. We decided, I think, to have a short talk and then get back down on the pitch, so there wasn't the, the confrontation coming out again. And then 
the second half sort of followed suit. I think we might have scored again, and then um, the the Fijian boys turned it turned it into a bit of a rugby game. I think I remember getting um, elbowed by one of the the centre backs. He got sent off, and then um, I think you must have. Well, I don't know if it was you yourself, but someone had yeah, started to call the call the cops in and to get a bit of a security because. It, I think we all knew what, what was sort of going to happen after the game. Um, the final whistle blew. We're obviously happy because we we pretty much know that we're going to, to be going to a World Cup. And the most vivid memory I have is Roy Krishna. Obviously, he was the, the, the Fijian superstar at that stage. Roy Krishna chasing me after the game, <laughs> trying to... <laughs> shit out of me <laughs> obviously he's much quicker than me so i probably ran to boxy or, or someone like that for a bit of pro bit of protection and i haven't let him live that down uh to this day and he gets very embarrassed when i bring it up to him <laughs> that Good seems thing. like a bit of a physical mismatch uv roy krishna you're obviously 19 year old brocky is quite a big powerful striker uh but krishna fancy fancy did he have the upper hand there he did fancy himself i think it was <laughs> He just must have saw that red mist, and then uh, the, the yeah the flying karate chop kick was coming was coming at me, and I'm running like that trying to get away from it. <laughs> it, it that, there was a there was a bit of a rivalry, I think, between it carried over into the Olympic qualifiers a couple of years later when the tournament was in in Fiji again. And um, I don't know if you remember him, but Carlos Bazzetti was the Fijian coach, and he was I think he was a Uruguayan guy. He was an older fellow, like in his sixties or seventies. And he had this slick back ponytails. It was definitely there was a not not a lot going on on top, but he had the ponytail pulled back. And him and Gouldie used to um, Jonathan Gould, who I think was Stu Jacobs' assistant, just yeah. used to just go at each other in the technical areas. And then Carlos was the same. As soon as Carlos saw the red mist, I think it must have filtered onto the pitch, and the players went ballistic as well. But yeah, there was a, there was a fierce rivalry between New Zealand and Fiji, kind of through the late two thousands. Absolutely. There was also another, I think that, that same under-23 qualifiers, we had a bit of a blowout with the Solomon Islands, I think, from yeah. memory, in Fiji, when Benjamin Tatori got sent off, I think even Nelson Saleh or Alec Maimai, there was, there yeah. was the middle was being pulled and all sorts um, at that stage too, I think. So we had I some think, um, yeah, I think Aaron Scott spoke about that, where Maimai, or some, one, of those, one of those guys, it was in Maimai got sent off after about seven minutes. Yeah, and um, and that was it. I mean, yeah, I think you're right. I think Nelson Saleh got followed suit, and they were down to nine, and that was that was that. You're off to an Olympics, but yeah, there you go. Jimmy, we, we spoke about Roy Krishna having the red mist. You seem to me like a fairly laid back character, but does the red mist come over you? Have you had any violent outbursts? Uh, got sent off? Is is fighting part of your history at any point? Uh I wouldn't. I wouldn't say um, I'm a too much of a fighter. I, I do like to have a little argument with a referee every now and then, or but I I, 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 I feed off defenders trying to give me a bit of a uh, like a rack up, and I enjoy that sort of individual battle. I think I've had two red cards in my in my career, both given to me by the same referee, which was Ian Walker back in my Canterbury United days. Definitely not red cards. <laughs> one of them, one of them after the game. I I remember my. My granddad telling me a story. He went up to him after the game. He goes, "Why are you sending my my grandson off?" And he goes, "No, he's been playing too much football anyway. It'll be good for the break." <laughs> <laughs> nice shot, granddad. Yeah. Um, we're we're going to get into the, the the Canterbury and the Nelson and and that sort of stuff soon. Um, I want to give the listeners a little bit of frame of reference about exactly where you are in your career right now and basically how big time you are. Um, I think a good example was, I think two days ago, you did a Twitter Q&A. And now for those who are aware of Twitter, um, Jeremy Brockie is one of New Zealand football's most followed footballers. Um, he's got 99,000 followers. I think he was putting a, a post out saying, like, help me get to 100K, which is pretty bloody massive. Uh, and he did a 20-minute Q&A invited you know all the south african fans to come and ask him questions and as a result uh i think it got turned around into two stories on mainstream south african sport websites um and to compare that to new zealand i, I can't think of many 
athletes, all blacks included, that if they did a Twitter Q&A, it would get turned around into, um, yeah. you know, mainstream stories on sports websites. Um, there would be a handful, but um, yeah, that, that sort of put things into perspective a little bit for me. Um, we had uh, Chris Bright on the show, and he talked to us a little bit about what life is actually like for you in South Africa, saying, you know, you can't actually go to the supermarket without getting mobbed. Um, can you can you give us a bit of light on exactly what your life looks like, what your level of celebrity is over there, and can you go to the supermarket without getting mobbed? <laughs> uh, variety. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start with the social media media stuff. I think before I when I left the Phoenix um, to come to South Africa, I think I had maybe three thousand or two two and a half thousand followers on on Twitter. Um, and then I came to South Africa, obviously very, very unknown. Um, a lot of the questions I got in my first media like press conference was, well, do Kiwis even play soccer? We thought you just play, play rugby in that country. Like, <laughs> what are you even sort of doing in our country to play football? Um, and then I, I, my, first, my first four games here in South Africa, I, I scored in, in all four, including against against Kaiser Chiefs, which is typically the, the biggest or one of the biggest well-supported clubs um, in Africa. And then that sort of carried on. And then I knocked another big club out, Orlando Pirates, out of a cup competition in the first round with a with another goal. And then I scored against um, the top three biggest clubs in South Africa, Mamelodi Sundowns, Chiefs and Pirates. And um, I came for the second half of the, the season and I scored. I was the first player to score against all three big clubs in one season. So that sort of got people got people talking. And um, I think the, the coach of Mamelodi Sundowns started uh, calling me and messaging me um, after about three months of being in the country saying that I want to I want to sign you. Um, so then, yeah, the profile grew um, from obviously scoring goals. Um, in South Africa, soccer is a predominantly black person's sport, and I'm allowed, you're allowed to say that. That's how they compare. Yeah. I said but, that. I said that. I got hammered for that when I was yeah. talking to Bridie about. about yeah. Anyway, carry on. Um, so, and obviously, yeah, being a, a white person in a predominantly black person's sport and doing well, um, I was standing out um, <laughs> even more. Um, so, and I think, yeah, so the social media following, scoring against big clubs. Um, that's how the, the profile sort of grew. Um, and then when I when I went to, to Marmalodi Sundowns, which is um, the biggest team in terms of winning trophies, especially in the, the, the more recent years, um, I think my social media profile grew from about 20,000 followers to 70 or 80,000 in the space of about a month. Um, and... And yeah, I do go to the supermarket and have to get asked for photos and stuff all the time. But it helps. I get free coffees and free lunches and um, free car washes and and um, so yeah, there, there is a certain celebrity uh, element, I guess. And 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 one of the reasons I do that question and answer thing is is to interact with um, the, the followers here in South Africa and, and give a little bit back and. Um, try and give honors as uh, uh, answers as honest as possible. <laughs> hmm. this, this, this could do wonders for our podcast, Steve. Having someone on here, maybe we'll boost our listenership in South Africa. Let's see. Well, yep. that's a good that's a good good point, Shay. Um, are the South African journos likely going to be pouring over this one for any little anecdotes they can spin into some uh, some page clickers? It's possible, isn't it, boys? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, big break. Good. <laughs> Um, but like just to, just to, to harp on that media thing, like again, in doing research for the for this this podcast, you've been on a number of of sports shows. Um, seems to be pretty high scrutiny. Even when you went to the UK, one of the hosts followed you and did the tour of Old Trafford with you and turned it into a little little YouTube kind of story. Is that kind of is that normal for footballers in South Africa to have that level of scrutiny, or is it again just because you are a little yeah. bit of an anomaly? Um, yeah, it is. It is quite a big sport here, and um, and I think like you look at other African countries like Nigeria, Togo, Egypt. Those those types of countries. A lot of their their players are playing over in Europe or or in different parts of the world. But a lot of South Africans, they 
they stay here in South Africa for that pure fact is like the celebrity status. I think uh, they've got so much ability, so much talent, but and they, they get interest overseas. They'll go there, and then after about a year, this is not all of them. Obviously, you've got Benny McCarthy and, yeah. and very successful players like that, but after a year, they'll come back because they're missing their, their little groups, um, that sort of... Yeah, celebrity, like you say, celebrity status of going out to the shops and and people knowing them and wanting to take photos and and they go to nightclubs and everyone hangs off them and and that type of stuff. So I think that is a, a, a big reason why why you don't see too many South African footballers and in, in the bigger leagues overseas. Mm. <clears throat> Great, Jerry. I want to take you back to 2004. So I want to sort of build up to where you are now. Um, and I think your career had quite an interesting trajectory because you kind of caught yeah, fire, caught fire. fire and then yeah. you kind of went out a bit and you were back playing National League and then you caught fire again and, and now you've gone on to have a pretty incredible career. But I'm just looking, we're, we're, Shay's put together a fantastic spread of your history and career as he does and i'm looking at um 2004 slash 05 you played for canterbury united uh and the stats suggest you played 15 games but you didn't score any goals but on the back of that you got signed for the new zealand knights um what do you remember about that phase were you a striker that didn't score that then got the knights gig or how did that all come about I think if I remember correctly, I was actually playing in a wide midfield role there at Canterbury. Um, I played a lot of my younger career as a as a wide player, and then even when I did make that step to the Knights, I think I was I was playing in sort of like a wider position, even wing back at times. Um, yeah, I when I was when I was younger um, in that Canterbury United time, um, I guess I think at that stage all teams had to have three under twenty players. Uh, I'd been playing very well for Nelson Suburbs. I think we won the league a couple of years in a row, which allowed me to, to get one of those under-20 spots in the Canterbury team. And I, th I don't, yeah, I also, I don't, well, if the stats say I didn't score, then I mustn't have scored. But uh, I think no, I'm, sometimes I, I'll, I'll take a, I can take a hit on that sometimes, factually incorrect. I copped up last week on a saying that a, a magazine had gone under in the, in the lockdown, and it definitely hasn't. So apologies oh, to New Zealand okay. House and Garden. Um, you guys are still operational. Um. <laughs> um, but I, I remember play, putting in some pretty consistent performances. Um, I think we did pretty well that season as well. And then again, I got invited up to a trial with the New Zealand Knights. Um, and the same situation, they had to have three players under the age of 20, uh, which sort of helped my case, I guess. I think I was 17 at that time when I, when I got the first contract, close to my 18th birthday. But I went up to that trial um and in that trial game I, I scored two goals um and then went back down to nelson and it must have been about a, a maybe a week after i got the phone call from from john ashton and he said uh pack your bags um tell your teachers you're you're not coming back to school because you're you're heading you're heading up to auckland so that was a, a massive dream come true um and yeah, I, I remember that very vividly as well so it was, it was 12 games for the Knights with four goals. And I think from memory, those four all came like right at the end of the season, didn't they? You had the blonde dreadlocks and you started tearing it up. And I remember it being a pretty disappointing season, but you were the bright light that came at the end. Like, well, shit, we've got this young kid, Jeremy Brocky, who looks the goods. Um, yeah. Cole, Cole Tinkler talked about his experience in that season with the Knights and – he talked about some of the unprofessional attitudes and the drinking and the wishing he had some stronger uh, role models and leaders in part of that setup. Did you share those experiences and how was that night season for you? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I remember when I first got into the to the environment, um, there was some obviously some big big players in there in terms of like Danny Hay, Noah Hickey, um, and and they brought a lot of. Well, at that time, they, they thought were, were big players from, from the English lower leagues as well, um, which a lot of them <laughs> seemed to fail. <laughs> um, but I, I remember going in there, um, started training, um, just buzzing to be a part of a, a professional environment in, in terms of a, a new setup, and everything was very exciting. 
Um, but the the coach sort of said to us young boys, uh, look, you're not you're not really gonna like play um, at the start of the season. You you're here to gain experience. Um, there's there's players in this team that are that have been around for a long time. They're gonna sort of do the job. Um, so just learn as much as you can and get your head down, train and, and try and become a better player and, and stuff like that. And um, no, it didn't didn't start off well. Oh, obviously, I accepted that. I was young and and but I was still keen and um, all about getting involved and, and training and stuff like that. And uh, the, the team didn't start off very well, obviously. Um, and there was definitely a, a big drinking culture in the team. Uh, I think I, 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 I don't mind a drink. I still don't mind a drink now. And I, I probably got um, caught caught in that as well. You, you like that that young young buck that you just want to um, go along with the crowd and and or if they're doing it then then it must be must be the right sort of thing to do and and then till, and then uh, it must have been about halfway during the season um, the team was obviously properly struggling and then I got an opportunity and uh, yeah four goals in the in the back end of the season and I think I finished top equal golden boot so it was all uh, all, all ahead of me was was the first goal for the Knights that kind of scruffy outside of the foot one that kind of dribbled in against yeah. Sydney? Was that the first goal that you scored? Um, was it against Sydney? Well, it was was it that goal though? That kind of I was against the Newcastle Jets, I think. Uh, right. I, so I came off the bench and I, I scored scored two to I think we still lost three two yeah. or something like that. But um, one of those first four goals was like a like a trademark volley that kind of yeah, set one the of them, for the rest one of your career. That's the new emblem. He, he, Flicked it over the back post where I like to hang out and hit it first time on the volley and um, uh, managed to hit a few more of them since. <laughs> we we talked about um, in previous episodes guys who enjoyed a drink and it derailed their careers. I'm thinking guys like, and I'm sure they wouldn't mind me saying it, um, Sam Jasper and perhaps Stu Hogg and, and those guys who, who I mentioned you were part of the friend group with. Did that come close to... To, I mean, to stopping all the hard work that you were doing in the training. You know, you said you enjoyed a drink. Was there a chance that you were going to piss it all all down the drain at one point? Um, not at that time. Not when I was there at the at the nights. I think I was still um, still young enough, and I had like good enough support from my, my family and stuff like that. Not that I was, I was going to them and saying I had a drinking problem. I, like I still had enough like people around me to encourage me, saying you've got got the whole sort of world at your feet. Um, keep dreaming and trying to keep, achieve those goals that you've set. Um, and I was I was determined to have a professional career for the rest of my um, well, I'm still playing now. So, um, but I think if if there was a time where I struggled. Was probably, and you know, I guess you're probably going to get to to that as well as as um, when I moved to Sydney FC. Um, at that time, after that night season, uh, I think there was eight teams in the league. I had offers from Perth, Newcastle, Melbourne Victory, um, Brisbane Roar, and and Sydney FC, who had just won the league the year before. But I was pretty close to signing for the Jets. Um, and Sydney FC came in at the very last, like last minute, just after they won, won the league. And um, I think I sort of thought, look, the best team in the league wants me. Uh, they've just won the league. Oh, this is perfect. But I wasn't thinking, oh, hang on, I'm going into a squad that's just. If I if I look back on it now, then I'm saying, oh, you're going into the best team. You're still, you're 18 years old. Um, You've just had a nice little 10, 12 game stint. It's probably not the best team to go to um, for for developing and, uh, and, and continuing continuing the career. Because that was that was at the height of the um, the FC bling kind of time, right? Was Dwight York still in the squad when you were there? Yeah, he was still there. Um, and I remember, as it is now, there's still a long break between between the seasons and. Um, so I finished that season with the Knights. I had already signed for Sydney, um, but I went back on loan to Canterbury United for the for the final series of of the NZFC, and uh, we played Auckland City, Kiwi Tears Street in the final. And mm-hmm. after I think after about twenty minutes, 
good old Ricky Van Steeden, bang, broke my foot and I was out for about uh, three months, I think, which then went on. And so I missed the whole of preseason um, with Sydney FC. The coach that signed me left. Terry Butcher came in. Um, I turned up to preseason, new club, injured. And I remember like the players there saying, oh, who does this guy think he is? Coming in injured, miss, trying to miss a preseason and, and stuff like that. So right from the very start, like moved away from New Zealand for the very first time. Um, I thought, Oof, this is going to be a, a good test here. Did you um, did you take your personalised number plate from the Knights across to Sydney? <laughs> 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 and, and, if, and what was on that personalised number plate? Oh, <laughs> I think it was NZ Knight New Zealand <laughs> or something, something like that. Brilliant. Yeah, one of my best prisons, that one. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so, okay, so you're at Sydney and you're in the Dwight York team. What, what do you remember from being part of that team how good was Dwight York what was he like off the field did you socialize with him oh he yeah, had a good good leaving party eh oh <laughs> <laughs> but I remember I think um where Dwight York had his own car park uh, which was pretty much not in the car park it was like drive up onto the the footpath and then like stop right there outside the change room door I think even not, not during my time when I was there, but the, in the first season, I think he had a helicopter that sometimes he uh, landed on the training pitch and, and rocked out into the to, to train from his helicopter. Um, I had a couple of couple of nights out with him. Um, obviously, the ladies and that just flopped around him, and I remember going to his his leaving party um, in Bondi. He obviously had hired out a hired out a whole area, got his own DJ in. And I think you probably invited every single chick that he had uh, met <laughs> <laughs> during his time in Sydney there. And I was a young 18-year-old boy. I think I still had my dreadlocks sitting in the corner going, this is good. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, and so what was he like um, as a person? Uh, was he quite laid back? Was, was he just there to party at that point in his career? Or was he still delivering uh, on the field? Yeah, it was, it was definitely still delivering on the field. Um, very laid back. I didn't really have too many ex like one-on-one -on -one exchanges with him, to be honest. Like because uh, he was a bit out of my my league in terms of celebrity status and and, and, that, and what have you. But um, to, to be on the same pitch and sharing the training field with him, with him was was pretty cool, especially as a Man United fan growing up as well. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. But he wasn't he wasn't the only kind of top professional or marquee player that you played with during the A-League. Robbie Fowler was with you at, at North Queensland. And was Emil Heskey at Newcastle at the same time? Uh, uh, I left before Heskey arrived. But, yeah, I had a had a season with Robbie Fowler as well, uh, which was oh, it was amazing. It was, it was obviously in the, the twilight of his career. Um, slowed down a little bit. But when he had the ball at his, ball at his feet, um, magic would happen. I remember just, just how smart he was, I think. Um, we got given a free kick just outside the box. Um, everyone's sort of sitting up the wall. The goalkeeper's leaning against the post, and he's just like, "I'm taking this quickly." Just, just clipped it over the wall, and like those types of things. Oh, it was, I was just in awe of. And I think Townsville probably wasn't the right place for him and his family. It was pretty, pretty small. I don't think his family really enjoyed it there that much. Um, but for the community, it was amazing. And then obviously got a, a bigger city move to, to Perth, where his family was a bit more happy. It must have been a real incredible joy, really, to even just to train with Robbie Fowler, like watching him during finishing training. Like, was he was he absolutely world class? Like, were you yeah. waiting in line behind him doing some drills and saying, oh, shit, here goes Robbie Fowler, I'm going to watch him? Yeah, no, I would always go in front of him because I, I know if you go behind him, you know he's going to score. So then everyone's watching to say, oh, he's going to score two in a row sort of thing. <laughs> so no, I would always shoot in front of him. Um, he was on a... On a restricted training, his own sort of training program as well, though, to make sure he was he was fine for the games. But uh, no, finishing training, oh, he would just always putting it in, into the into the corners, into the side of the net, and um, yeah, it was a joy to watch, really.
Mm. Okay, um, so so 2007, Brocky, um, you had the dreadlocks. You were kind of, you know, you'd caught fire, I guess. You were 19, 20 years old. Um, what what were you like as a player? Obviously, you're a different player now. You're more of a striker. Um, but what were you then? What were your strengths? Were you Did you have real out-and-out out pace or were you clever or what were you, What was the best part about your game? Yeah, I've, I've never had like the, the step-overs and, and those sort of skills in my locker. I think I was, I was quite direct. Um, so I'd pick the ball up quite like deep in, in the half and sort of go on like a bit of a, a mazy run, like cutting inside and, and linking up and, and, and those types of things. Um, so I was quite a, yeah, quite a direct and, and I, was still, I was quite big, big in stature. So I was quite um, powerful in, in terms of when I was dribbling with the ball at my feet. Uh, definitely a different player now, but um, I, I was uh, when I was growing up, I always worked on my finishing, um, especially um, volleying and, and, and stuff like that. I can remember uh, every day after school, I'd go to the park with a couple of mates. We'd play exactly the same game. One of us would go and goal. The person in the, in the goal um, would have the balls. They'd clip it out to, the, to, the, to one of us on the edge of the box. If you hit it first time, you get two points. Uh, if you take a touch and finish, you get one point. So I was always uh, always that competitive nature. wanted to wanted to get to the end quicker and, and was was trying to perfect that volleying technique. Because you well, have... Oh, God. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go. I'm going to run with this. Because you have scored some worldies, um, volleys in particular. And I pulled I pulled a quote from the A-League website way back when, and it, I'll, I'll read it out to you, and then you've, you've kind of... The story you've just told was your reply in the article, almost word for word. But the quote was... Um, Jeremy Brocky rarely scores ugly goals, and they're never by chance. The kind you and your mate score once in a blue moon, those exceptional moments where carefree ambition and blind luck come together. And those, again, those like those volleys, um, there's a couple that you've scored in South Africa, like proper worldy goals. I remember one at Westpac, which wasn't a volley, but it was from like a million miles out, and that's gone in as well. Like the, Your highlight reel is, is pretty impressive. And, and you do put it down to kind of that, Early, that early, those early days knocking about in, in Nelson and Christchurch? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's, it's nice to score those sort of spectacular <laughs> goals as well. Uh, I can remember probably the, my first memory of scoring a, a, a goal like that was um, when I was playing for, for Richmond. And it was just after um, Zidane had scored that, that volley in the Champions League final with his, with his left foot. And literally, like, it was like two weeks after that, a, a, a ball came over and I hit it with my left foot exactly the same as how Zidane finished it. And, like, the, everyone on the pitch was just like, what the hell? <laughs> where, where have you just pulled this Zidane from? And, like, it's sort of just always been something that I've uh, managed to, to keep creating. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so so we've we're riding the riding the wave here. So you you're at Sydney, you played seven games, no goals for Sydney, and then you obviously released. And so my memory of Jeremy Brocky, again, we were same age, and I sort of I think we were perhaps even competing. You may not know this, we were competing for uh strike spot on the Olympic team at one point. So I was keeping abs on the other strikers that I was competing with. Brocks um, don't get started on Sam Missum here, but it'll just it'll oh. derail. It'll derail the podcast, but carry on. <laughs> and so you went back to Hawks Bay United, and I remember um, you being on the bench. You know, you, you had been the up and coming star. You had been the main man. You'd played A League, and then you bounced back, and you were playing National League for Hawks Bay, who I think were maybe a mid-table team. And I remember you found yourself on the bench for a few games, and I, I kind of couldn't really understand what was happening. Um, so maybe you could sh shine some light on that, and then I think you you got selected for the Olympic squad, and then I think there was one game against Australia where you scored an absolute worldie, where you beat about five players and nuts the sort of okay. Australian international defender, and then took the piss out of the keeper, and it seemed like, and then you scored a goal against China at the Olympics, and things just took off for you again. But talk to me about that stage at Hawke's Bay and what happened and were you low on confidence or what was happening around your career at that point? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to just rewind just a, a little bit back to to the release at Sydney. So 
Um, I signed two years originally at Sydney, um, and obviously I've, we've already touched on how it didn't um, start off too well with with the injuries and and stuff like that. And at that stage, the Knights were going defunct, and the the Phoenix were starting to gain some traction. And uh, it was a, it must have been I think it was even the same time as I came back for the, the under twenty World Cup qualifiers. And Ricky Herbert was was going to be the man in charge of of the Phoenix. Um, he was obviously the national team coach then as well. And so I'm I'm six months into my two year contract at, at Sydney. Uh, things are obviously aren't going very well. And I got Ricky Herbert um, calling me every week. Um, Brox, can you get out of your Sydney deal? I want you to to come to the Phoenix. Brox, please get out of your Sydney deal. And then they came over, played against Sydney. Come to the hotel, mate. I want to talk to you about the Phoenix. So I'm like, oh, I'll go to the hotel. Um, all good. The end of the season came. I went to Sydney. I don't know. Obviously, they probably wanted wanted to get rid of me as well. I just made it easier for them by by going to them and and saying, um, I want to I want to go home. Like oh, I'm not really enjoying it here. Can I can I be released from the from my from my second year? They said, Yep, no problem. We came to a settlement and then. Um, Rung Ricky Herbert, answer phone, left messages. Rung Ricky <laughs> Herbert, answer phone, messages, <laughs> left messages. Never heard back from him. This is when the, the Phoenix are obviously starting to get up and running now. And the mm. 20 World Cup is, is coming around. Um, and we actually started training, a few of us, because I had already left Sydney by then. I'd, I'd moved back to Wellington to, to prepare for the Under 20 World Cup. Started training with the Phoenix just a little bit like a few of us. Um, so there I'm one-on-one -on -one with them and I sort of said, look, why are you not answering my phone calls anymore? You're you asking me to, to get you to get out of the club and um, no, you're not answering me. What's going on? He said, as soon as you get back from the Under-20 World Cup, the contract will be waiting for you. Okay, cool. No problem. Go, keep training. Go to the World Cup. I think it was after the last game. Um we played Mexico. We're all yeah. sitting there at, at uh, dinner, and Stu Jacobs, the, the head coach, comes in and says, I um, just want to congratulate Jacob Spoonley, Greg Draper, and oh, I can't even remember who the other one was. Might not have even been another New Zealand player. Um, they've secured uh, con under 20 contracts at the, at the Phoenix, and I was like, oh, oh no. <laughs> Like yeah. now my life is like, shit, what am I going to do? So then that's when um, Jonathan Gould was the head coach of, of Hawks Bay. And he sort of said, like he was also involved with the under 20 team. He said, come, come to Hawks Bay. Like, let's try and get you back on track. Um, and I've got a good relationship with Gordy. So I thought, yeah, this is probably the right thing for me to do. And I went there, but I was just so like disappointed with how everything had sort of and out like a, like a, I was still enjoying football, but like they're just being so young and not knowing really how to deal with that properly. Um, and then Stu Hogg and all that were, but they were also there at Hawks Bay. So <laughs> the, thirsty whale, the thirsty whale had a couple of visits. <laughs> <laughs> Dangerous combo. Yeah, and that's when I probably found myself there on the on the bench. I think I picked up a bit of weight, um, and Jonathan Gould was like. Look, man, you're like it's your career here. You need to like sort of the Olympics are around the corner, and then we went to so I didn't really fire for Hawks Bay like you mentioned, and then I relocated to to Wellington um, before the Olympics was was sort of gonna uh, it must have been already after the qualifying, so in between the qualifying and the actual Olympics itself, and Stu Jacobs, Jonathan Gould, and the, um, the fitness trainer Andy Smith sort of pulled me aside and said, if we're to pick the Olympic, because I thought oh, I'm a sort of a guarantee for, for the Olympics. And they, they pulled me aside and said, if we name the squad today, you're not going to the Olympics. And I was like, oh, shit. And that like really hit me. So then I went away and I'm like, oh, man, I've got to, I've got to fucking turn my life around here, sort of um, sort myself out. And so I stayed there. I stayed there in Wellington for maybe it must have been three months. Worked with the fit, strength and fitness guy every single day. There was me, Jack Pelter, and 
think even Michael Boxtel might have been there, Tim Schaefer's every now and then. Uh, we're working every single morning, every afternoon. And I just got into the best shape of my life. And then leading up to the, the game that you mentioned, the Australian game, I started scoring in, in little like friendlies and scored those two goals in the, at the Australia. And I think I ended up scoring leading up to the Olympics, maybe eight or nine goals in, in 10 games going into the, that Olympic Games and um, scored that goal in the Olympics. And then that's when North, North Queensland Fury um, got on the phone and said, uh, we want to get you back into the A-League. So I had the, the lowest of lows and then with the hard work and effort um, that it took me to, to get back to where I am, um, the highest of highs too. Who, who are you pointing at after you scored that goal against China at the Olympics? I'm not really sure. I was just that excited that we're down to 10 men. Cheers, oldie. And we've just gone 1-0 up in front of 90,000 Chinese fans with about 25 New Zealanders in the crowd. It was, it was yeah. a big goal. I remember it vividly. That was huge. You talk about career highlights. That that would, I mean, that team, was it Chris Killen and Ryan Nelson and, you know, yeah, these... Yeah, and you scoring that goal was that is that a career highlight? Is that your yeah. the career highlight? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there and, and being part of the 2010 World Cup squad um, are, are on par with each other. But to to score in front of the host nation um, when you're down to ten men uh, in an Olympic Games in front of the whole world, it was just an unforgettable moment. Um, then unfortunately, I got two yellow cards in the first two games and missed the third. <laughs> Because <laughs> that, that um, under-20 World Cup experience that you spoke about before was, I don't want to be disrespectful, was pretty unspectacular though, right? Three games, I think three losses, kind of went out at the group stage with a, with a whimper. Like a few players, like you said, picked up contracts, but I think fast forward 12 months in the Olympics was a totally different kind of experience. Yeah, it was. And um, even then, like I was, I thought I was going to be the, the, the main main striker at, at the Olympics and I, I played the first two games but it wasn't really in any sort of form and then um, Greg Draper played in the in the third one. I think I might have actually got, got lucky. I think someone else got, fell sick or something. So I might, I might have played in all three but it, yeah, it wasn't really. It was an un, unforgettable experience but it wasn't a, a memorable um, from a playing point of view. You, Jeremy, you mentioned your frustrations at Ricky not picking up the phone. Um, did you did you still have a relationship with him after that, or how was your relationship with him following that saga? Yeah, well, it was still the national team coach, so it's not like I could have um, sort of packed the sad or or come out and said anything or or, or anything like that because it was then and then I'm starting to put my my national um, future on the line, so. I sort of just um, put it to the back of my head and uh, as much as it was hurting and um, still still something that I, I can fondly remember now, but uh, I, I couldn't sort of, he, he had all the all the playing playing power and, and, and was holding all the cards at the end of the day. So I sort of just had to accept what it, the decision that he had made and then uh, work hard to try and get, get back into the national team as well. So okay, so after the um, Olympics, you picked up the contract with North Queensland Fury. Do yep. you, do you think that was based on the goal you scored in Australia, or was it your performances at the World Cup? Was it the goal against China? And how many clubs came in for you at that point? Yeah, I think it was off the back of the goals against Australia, to be honest, because the the coach Ian Ferguson, um, he was. I think he, he was at the Central Coast Mariners as an assistant. So he knew my time from when I was at the, the Knights. And then he was also there at that game because um, he was already had been announced as the, as the Fury coach. So I think it was that game that um, allowed me to, well, got me a, another contract um, back in the A-League. And you moved to Townsville and you meet your now wife, Jessica, or Jess, um, it's kind of interesting how it all kind of pans out in that regard. Uh, yeah, it is. Um, and again, like from a football point of view, it wasn't wasn't the best year. I, I remember breaking my leg in in January, and um, 
and I, again, I think maybe I only scored one goal in that time as well. But um, yeah, the, the the most memorable moments from from my time at Townsville was definitely uh, meeting meeting Jess. It was a it was a pretty small it's a pretty small community. Everyone sort of knew each other, and uh, it was actually the night New Zealand qualified for um, the World Cup, uh, the playoff game there in in, in Wellington. I, again, I wasn't. I'd been injured before that. Uh, I was fully fit, um, and uh, I think I remember doing a bit of an interview um, saying uh, that I was fully fit, and uh, don't know don't know why I didn't get selected because I'd obviously been at the Confederations Cup um, earlier that year. Um, but uh, look, I ended up going to the World Cup. I missed out on the the unreal experience there, but I uh, also met my uh, future wife on that night. She didn't know anything about football. Um, no, I met her the night before and we went out for, for dinner and then I said, look, New Zealand's playing in a World Cup playoff tomorrow night. Um, kind of a big deal. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm gonna be um, watching it and having some drinks and if I see you later in town, I'll probably uh, apologise for anything that I might do or might not, um, depending on how, how New, Zealand, uh, New Zealand go. And uh, obviously we qualified and I... I remember seeing her that night. I think I, I took a, a rose to her at the nightclub, but I don't remember anything else. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the All Whites beat Bahrain. And they go into the World Cup. That You've just missed out. You, you must have come bloody close to making that squad. Does that light another fire under your ass that this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to go to a World Cup? I'm going to do everything I can to get in that squad. Yep, absolutely. And it was a little bit of a different scenario because at the end of January, uh, the World Cup was obviously in, in June. At the end of January, I broke my leg. Um, and so I was out for, for about two months. Of the, but there was a cutoff date of, of when New Zealand had to announce their, their team by. Um, so I was on a bit of a rush for time. Um, like you say, it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And I think um, with the mental preparation and, and all the hard work and, and having that World Cup deadline date in mind, it allowed me to recover a lot quicker. Um, the, the physio and, and strength trainer there and, and the Fury were all on the same uh, wavelength in terms of trying to get me fit for it. And I remember coming over to, to Auckland once I was back playing um, for about a week-long camp and I had to come over to, to sort of test my fitness. And I remember the, the most mine mentally is going in for challenges and sort of that contact. I remember after every session, uh, Rolly would pull me aside. Uh, he'd put a ball in the middle of us and we'd just practice like that, that contact, that tackling. And uh, I think I'd probably put him on his, put him on his ass a couple of times. But, uh, yeah, I don't feel like he's the, um, he's the number one person that you want to no, test that strength. Like I was going to a 50-50 with Rolly. It probably, probably wasn't doing much for me, was it? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but no, I got got through that week, and then um, the the twenty three man squad got announced, and uh, got the number number twenty two shirt. Legend has yeah. it you were on a plane when when that was announced, and you didn't know until you landed. Yeah, I think I might have been on a on a flight or something like that. that yeah, that's a, it was. Uh, yeah, I was on a flight from. I can't remember where I was on the flight to, but I remember. When I when I landed and my phone turned the phone on and the messages started coming through, I thought, "Ah, oh, this has got to be, this has got to be good news." And obviously, I opened up the the one from my old man first and said, uh, "I said you're in." So, so re refresh my memory, Brocky. At that point, who were you competing with uh, to get a starting gig or to get in the squad for the World Cup games? Were you a striker at the time, or were you being used as a wide player? I was being used as a wide player. So we had um, Ricky's formation of. Three, four, three. Uh, we obviously had the big, the big men up front, and um, Killy, Rory, um, so the, and Smeltzy. So the, the front positions were, were sort of already taken there. And most of my always career, um, I've played in that sort of that wide wing back role under Ricky. And um, so I, I was always able to to duly fit in in any of those two wider positions, and, and can could could do a job up front as well. So. Um, I think that, that um, being able to play a couple of different positions definitely uh, helped my cause. One of the great 
debating points for those who weren't there um, was how much influence Ryan Nelson had on that team versus Ricky Herbert. H- how much how much credit do you give to Ryan Nelson for the set of results at that World Cup? Yeah, I, like, I can not speak highly, more highly enough um, for, for Ryan. He's like an unbelievable leader um, in the dressing room, um, whether it's at a team meal. Um, and, he, and he introduced this sort of like circle of life thing um, before every game that we played. So we'd have our pre-match meal and then between that time of going to, to get dressed to leave for the stadium, um, we would sit in a circle and um, anyone was, was able to sort of say a little bit to um, encourage the boys or um, just just some motivation, really, just to, 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 get, to get that team feeling. And, and something I remember Ryan, Ryan saying um, was, don't, don't leave anything out on the on the pitch don't don't come off after the 90 minutes and say oh i wish i had have run back that extra 20 meters to make that tackle or i wish i had have darted into the box to try and get onto the end of that cross and every time he spoke it's just like an awe and he says it with so much like passion and enthusiasm that like that alone was enough to to make you want to like run through a brick wall for him and Obviously, his his career and background and and where he played and oh, it's just I can yeah no, I've got um, I, I'm in, in awe of of Nelly and um, he's just fantastic fantastic guy and I think he was definitely the 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 ring leader and 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 everyone can see that the leader from from on the pitch that he is. And you linked up with him uh, when he was. Uh, manager at Toronto FC was that kind of made easier because of that relationship? Did you did you choose to go or say to Ryan, look, fuck, I want I want to come to Toronto and play for you over there? How did that come about? Yeah, it was after the season at the my first season at the Phoenix when I scored um, quite a lot of goals. Um, again, the off season being long in the A League, um, the MLS had, had sort of just started, and it was Ryan's first coaching gig, and um, I got a phone call from him saying uh, we're interested to bring you in on loan for. For three months and there's no like second thought or or anything i'm just like yeah get the paperwork sorted get me on the plane um we had a, an off-season holiday book to go and see my mum with with our young daughter at the time um and then we were going up to see my wife's parents in australia and i sort of said babe i've got to i've got to go to, to toronto and she went up to back up to townsville took piper up there for for a month and joined joined me a month later but um uh, even as a, as a coach, um, as training sessions, um, same sort of thing as, as pre-match talks and and um, enthusiasm. It was just uh, that, that three months that I was there was was fantastic. And um, was, was some, I wanted to stay there; they wanted to keep me, um, but the the agreement between the Phoenix and Toronto couldn't couldn't happen, unfortunately. We've just jumped uh, over past year, North Queensland Fury. So 14 games there, one goal I've got, and then you went to the Jets. Um, how did that – what happened there? Yeah, so at that time, um, like I said, I was injured for the for the, for the the end of the, the Fury season. And, um, again, there was rumours if the club was going to survive, there was money problems. Um, because I was taking up a foreign spot and had been injured for quite a lot of the season, they sort of said, "Oh, we're not really. Well, you can. We're, we're putting you to the side at the moment, and we'll make a decision on you later." And um, it was it was tough because um, obviously the relationship with Ricky and the Phoenix. I knew that there was no chance that I was going to be able to go there, especially after not not really playing. So um, an agent called me out of the blue um, and said. Uh, the Franco Kalina wants to sign you with the Jets. Um, I said, "Yeah, no problem. What's the what's the deal?" And I think it was minimum wage. So I must it was about sixty thousand. Um, and I think the second season was was sixty five thousand or something like that. I was like, "Yeah, where do I sign?" Um, <laughs> Two year deal for for someone who's been injured for for most of the season. Uh, I'll definitely take that. <laughs> yeah. And that led you 41 games, 11 goals. It seems like you kind of found your feet in a way. You realised you were 
definitely a league quality um and then you you bounce back to the phoenix after that yep um the first season at the jets again didn't really go to go to plan i had like a, a couple of injuries i think um good old ruben zankovic uh broke my foot he, he loved the tackle he broke my foot in training so that kept me up for a, for a lot of the the first season and then the se second season when i scored i think nine or ten goals in the in the season um just before the end of that season, I had an offer from China. Um, there was there was only two, I think three games to go in the season. Um, but the, the the three games went outside the Chinese window, and and I'd already decided that I wasn't going to stick around with the Jets. I was going to go um, for a new opportunity uh, with the Phoenix. Had already obviously shown interest at that stage. Um, and I, I was pleading with the club to, to, to let me go on this Chinese deal. Um, they they said, oh, no, we, we still got a chance of making the finals. I think we had to win all three games or something like that. And that still wasn't even guaranteed. I'm just like, but, but I'm not staying here next season. We've already come to that agreement. Like, get a little bit of money and, and, and let me on my way sort of thing. And and unfortunately, that didn't, didn't happen. Uh, it would have been nice for the bank account. But... Uh, Ended up signing for the Phoenix yeah, a couple of weeks later. Mm. Was that Chinese and, stuff off the back of the Olympic performance, or was it kind of just completely? No, nah, that was off the back of a, a pretty good season with with the um, Newcastle Jets. Um, there was an agent that had taken the Griffiths brothers brothers to to China a few times. Um, they got my name in with the club there, and, and they were keen. So that's how that came about. Uh, and then into so, Wellington. Yeah, then into Wellington, uh, signed a, a three-year contract there. Uh, it was nice to, to be going home. Um, obviously, myself and Ricky must have made up, kissed and made up by that time. No, it was all water <laughs> under the hood by then. Obviously, that was after the World Cup and, and all that sort of stuff. So it was nice to go home um, to some familiar surroundings um, and have a, have a really good season and, and the team that, that struggled. Yeah, so you scored a, scored a lot of goals at, at the Phoenix, um, and your profile grew. You were a favourite with the Yellow Fever. Um, it seemed like you'd really found a home uh, in Wellington. Um, but then you you got the contract offer from South Africa and and went there. So yeah, how how hard was it leaving Wellington? And with with did the Phoenix fight to hard to keep you? Um, so. Um, obviously, Ricky left after that first season or towards the end of that first season and then that's when Ernie Merrick came in. And, um, Ernie Merrick was, was the head coach of Melbourne Victory at the, the time after the second season when, and when he wanted to, to take me after that nice season. and He sort of said, I want to build my team around you again. Uh, this is when I was trying to actually stay at Toronto and he said, no, I want you to come back. I want to build a team around you. Just had a good season. I can't really afford to lose you. And then I uh, started to, to go a little bit downhill there, really. When I went back to, to the Phoenix, Ernie played a formation that didn't really suit me. He had the two like what sort of wide strikers, and um, that's when Nathan Burns came in, and, and Roy was obviously there doing well. Um, and, and he just wanted those wide players to, to make certain runs, um, certain movements, and if you don't do those movements or certain runs, then... Um, you're not really going to play. And I was like, well, this doesn't really like suit my sort of style of play, like running wide. I'm, I'm past those days of, of, of running a player. Like I'm more of a player that sort of relies on service into the box now. And I think obviously I, I started um, the season there and it wasn't really working. Um, and then that's when South African club approached me um, and I, I – I went, I went to Ernie and I said, look, it's not really working here. Um, is, there, is there any possibility I can, I can uh, leave? I've had an offer from, from South Africa and I want to go. And he said, his, his reaction was, do you know in South Africa, everyone carries guns around in their back pocket. Have you told your wife that? And I was like, oh, this is going to be harder than, <laughs> than I expected. And, and Ernie could sort of see where I was coming from. Um, I think we had both accepted that I didn't suit the, the style of play. Um, but the the owners of the Phoenix sort of wanted to keep me around because I was a Kiwi and didn't really want to let me go. And I, so the South African club 
think they offered maybe around fifty thousand uh, US dollars or something like that, and and the deal got done, and um, I headed there in the uh, before my contract expired with the Phoenix, and now we've been here for over five years. Yeah, so you've been there five years. Um, has it gone better than you could have imagined when, when you first left South Africa? Like, is this the absolute dream result? You're still going strong. You've been there five years. You've got a hundred thousand Twitter followers. You're a celebrity. You know, you've you've made it. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, I think at that time, like the South African club was keen, and they had offered me a two and a half year deal, and there was a offer from two clubs in Malaysia, but they were only one year contracts and. Um, at that time, we had two two kids, and we thought, let's go for the the, the security. Um, obviously, everyone in South Africa can speak English, and it's a lot of South Africans come to New Zealand, so it's probably going to be reasonably easy to to sort of settle in a country like South Africa. I had good memories from from being there in the 2010 World Cup, so I thought that we thought let's let's go on let's go on this joyride and and sort of see where it takes us and. And then, um, like I said, we, we started, I came halfway through the season, um, didn't play in the first game. The coach would have said, oh, a lot of players, foreigners, they come here and struggle. So I just want to sort of like ease you in and um, get you used to the league. And so I didn't play in the first game, but the striker got suspended. And they get the next game, oh, I've got to, I don't really want to throw you in, but I'm going to throw you in because uh, the other striker is injured. And then I scored four in the first four games and, and never looked back really <laughs> is, is it quite difficult playing over there and doing well but being a bit sight unseen to the majority of the new zealand footballing public i mean running parallel to this anthony hudson was in charge of the all whites from 2014 to 2018 i think he used you in a few games early doors and then largely ignored you for three years despite you kind of taken off in south africa so yeah. Is that was that frustrating that you weren't perhaps being recognised for what you were doing over there? Yeah, it was massively frustrating. Um, I was in Korea, Korea form, Korea best form, um, consistently scoring goals, um, started winning trophies. So then, yeah, had that sort of mentality, that winning mentality, and and trophies to to your um, to your resume as well. And I just kept like I played the first couple of games under under Hudson. <laughs> Scored my first international goal. Hey, <laughs> we'll, get there, we'll get there eventually. <laughs> uh, international goal, uh, and I thought, oh, this could be the start of. of, of finally, I'm, I'm um, the first first goal for the national team's ticked off. Um, now we can sort of push on with that. Get that now that's out of the way, and um, like I say, a career best form. And I, every time a window would come up, I would get get the email, the extended squad you're in the extended squad um, but then probably and then that always says what day the, the team's going to be um, announced and probably the day before that team's going to get announced my phone's ringing it's Anthony Hudson hey Brox how are you mate uh, good good uh, it's good to see you doing well over there still scoring goals I'm like yeah loving life really fit um, can't be any happier he's like okay yeah so this phone call is not really going to be very good um yeah, I know you're doing well there, mate, but uh, you're not going to be selected in the squad. I said, like, okay, then uh, well, I'll keep, I'll keep, I'll keep scoring, <laughs> I'll keep winning games, and uh, we'll see how the next next window goes. Same thing, it comes through. Hey, Brox, uh, yeah, yeah, I know you're still scoring goals, but uh, so, okay. And then after about four, maybe three or four of them, I said, look, I appreciate because I'm a senior player, you're calling me and saying. Um, and giving me that that like one on one look, um, I'm not not going to select you in the squad. But I said, look, <laughs> it's only like breaking me breaking me really because I'm doing well. Uh, I love playing for my country, and you're ringing me to tell me that again I'm not being selected. I said, so like, as much as I appreciate the calls, like you don't need to do it anymore because it just it just hurts really. And he said, no, okay, I can appreciate that, and then. So I sort of thought uh, my international career is probably probably over, um, especially under the the Hudson regime. And then got got the uh, 
the, obviously the World Cup qualifier was coming up and, and got the phone call saying, oh, I'm going to bring you and Rory Fallon into the squad and because uh, because you've got experience and you're good around the boys, so I'm going to bring you in. And then he ends up giving me my 50th cap. <laughs> yeah, so what did you think of that reasoning for bringing... I mean, were you surprised that he reached out and used that reasoning to bring you in as opposed to you're on you're playing well? It's your experience yeah. and your... Camaraderie, yeah, I mean, where you can bring the boys yeah. together. Yeah, to be fair, when the when the phone like first started ringing, I was like, oh, "Here we go again." <laughs> <laughs> I know that I'm not in the squad, so like, <laughs> but I answered it, and he goes, "Hey, Brox, how you going, mate?" As he normally does, I said, "Yeah, yeah, I'm all good." Uh, I said, "Oh, you must be getting the squad ready for for the qualifiers now." He goes, "Yep," and I've got some good news for you. You're in. <laughs> <laughs> what? Hang on, what's going on here? And then he, said, and he sort of said like. I'm not. I'm not bringing in you in to guarantee you any any playing time. Um, look, if you impress me in training, then 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 you could get something. But uh, I'll bring you in more from an experience point of view. Um, got a lot of young players in the squad, um, and just for a, for a big game, there's going to be big crowds and and stuff like that. So I think that you'd be good to give some experience to the younger players. And I thought, yeah, no problem. Like. I've never turned my turn my country down. Um, we on the plane, and I got there and I was training well. And I probably gave him when he when he looked down the the line um, over in uh, Peru, and he saw. I think Smeltzy was also on the bench then. I think it was me, Smeltzy, and and Rory. He told us all to go warm up, and I thought oh, I'll go warm up. I'll go warm up in front of this amazing crowd, but I'll probably be Smeltzy or Rory are probably going to get the old. <laughs> Come, come! You coming on? And all of a sudden, my name's being called out, and I'm running onto a on an into an atmosphere of un, unforgettable, electric. Um, to get my fiftieth cap, and um, amazing. Yeah, was what, it better what? than? Oh no, Stevie, you go because I'll, I'll call jump back to mine in a minute. What's the reasoning? I can't understand the reasoning why you'd call someone and say, "I'm not bringing you over to play." You know, you're not going to get any game time. Is that? to motivate you or is that just why, why would you say that I don't understand yeah. that. Well, I'm not really sure and probably only Hudson can answer that but I took that <laughs> I took that as no I'm going to prove to you and show you that you've actually been missing out on something for the last two or three years and um, I guess once I got into that training environment and, and I started training and then if, he, if, he's, if he's calling me on in front of two players that have delivered on the big stage before um, if he's calling me on in front of them, then I must have done something pretty well in training, and maybe I gave him a couple of regrets. It's just mind games, isn't it? Hudson playing 4D chess. He's so far inside yeah. your head. He knew exactly what you needed to hear. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Shay. I wanted to uh, to ask you, Brox, about the comparison of, of that game in Peru versus the game at um, the Azteca in Mexico City. In the cycle before, how were those two? Because, like, uh, for me, that's a career highlight going to that game. I think Fulch mentioned it as a highlight of his, and Roley mentioned it as a highlight of his, the, the Azteca at Mexico City. Where does that stand for you in wow. terms of wow. your that career? Difficult to separate those two. I think my fondest memory of the of the Azteca is obviously the change rooms are underneath underneath the stadium, and you go for your your walk on. On the on the pre-match walk on the pitch before the before the game before you go get changed and I think it must have been like I think it was me maybe Tommy Woodsy and and um, Mikey McGlinchey we were the first to go up onto the onto the pitch and like you walking up the the concrete stairs there and obviously it's reasonably quiet and the fans you can hear some chatting and and stuff like that going on but as soon as they spotted. Kiwis coming out of that tunnel. Oh, the atmosphere just turned like the whistling and like it just was deafening. It was like, oh, was oh to be like the, one of the first ones to come up and experience it from the start was just like, wow, this is amazing. I think the difference between the two was the game in Peru. Obviously, there was a lot of mind games in the build up with the, the fighter jets flying around the, the hotel and, and the, all the media and cameras and that camped outside the hotel and, and stuff like that and on the bus on the way to the game like the streets were just packed of supporters of Peru for about 
probably two or three K. They're, they're just lined up on the street and they were like running along, throwing stuff at the bus. They obviously had the horses and the security guards going along with the bus. And then again, going out onto the stadium, two, two and a half hours, maybe, maybe two hours before the, sta- the stadium was packed. And like they were, as soon as they saw us go out onto the pitch, like they just started chanting and singing. And it was just, again, deafening and another unbelievable experience. Um, Hudson and Andy Martin both made comments in the media about how disruptive all that stuff was to the build-up and made a point of trying to make the New Zealand crowd be a bit more hostile when they came to Wellington. Do you remember, like, they said it kept the team up all night and things, the fighter jets overhead. Did it, how disruptive was it? Or was that just all bullshit? No, I think they were just trying to maybe save a little bit of bacon. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> like I think the so the, the fighter jets were circling the hotel, um, sort of like that afternoon nap time on the day of the game, um, but they maybe were hanging. They hung around for maybe five minutes or something like that. Um, the the night before, we're we're sleeping maybe I don't know, twenty twenty two stories up uh, on on the top of the hotel, obviously for that for that reason then. And there was some fireworks going off. I think the fireworks went off maybe like 1 a.m., 2 a.m., and 3 a.m. Um, but it wasn't enough to like keep you from going back to sleep. <laughs> I think maybe I heard the first ones and then I didn't hear hear any again. But the the, the like the fans and that were just fanatical there. I mean, um, there was a couple of cafes across the road um, from the hotel. Um, three of us. Or maybe four of us decided to go over and have a coffee and like just out of nowhere there was like 15 20 cameramen just like coming and surrounding us and trying to obviously we had security in that there like locals that said hey move off let them have their sort of coffee in peace but like that whole just love of football was just um, there on, on the show yeah Brox, we, we can't talk about the All Whites without talking about the kind of monkey you struggled to get off your back for a long period there. I think it was, was it 48, 49 games before you got your first goal? Yeah. Um, that, it's a bit of a, a joke maybe at, at this point, but was it something that actually phased you? Like, did you really struggle with it at any point or did you think you were, I don't know, cursed or jinxed in any way or how were you dealing with that? Um yeah, I know. It was, it, was, it was so strange because most most clubs that I've been at, I've scored like on a reasonably re- regular occasion, and and um, then you've got that horrible statistic of of the national team. And um, I would try and protect myself a little bit and say I started some games at left back for the national team um, and played a, played a lot of those games um, as wing backs as well, but. It's not an excuse for having a better strike rate ratio. I played, and I probably played enough games as a as a striker to to definitely have a better um, ratio than than what I have. That's for sure. And I think I, I sort of gave up after the the Mexico qualifier when I got when I got taken down in the box, and I thought we're already at what seven. <laughs> 7 nil on Agri or something. I said, Smelty, sorry, so I'm taking this penalty. I've got to get this first goal. And as soon as I kicked it, like, you know, you know yourself, as soon as you kick it, you know whether it's going on or not. And as soon as it came off my foot, I thought, this is it. I hadn't looked up yet. I thought, this is a great height for the keeper. And then as you have that little glance up, you can see him going the right way. And you go, this is just the <laughs> Oh, no. Painful. It's great you can laugh about it because you even you, you tweeted about it at the same time. You use social media to kind of at least at least deal with it rather than hide away from it. So you know, fair play to you for for fronting up with it. Yeah, and I, I apologise to Smelty after I said sorry, Smelty. You could have got another goal in your in your in your uh, repertoire there. And he goes, No, don't worry, son. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk about your, your last few years that you've been in South Africa. Um, you mentioned that you're not the player you once were. So are you being used predominantly as like a target man striker now? What does your game look like these days in the last sort of three three years? Yeah, um, yeah. most of my game this, these days are, are both, um, is based on, on getting balls into the box and, and me getting on the end of things, I think. Um, that's when I'm, I'm definitely at my best now. Um, 
and I think that's probably since I made the move to to Mamalodi Sundowns, um, that's probably what sort of hampered my progress there. Is it's not really a uh, yeah, it's not really a team that um, delivers the ball into the box or a team that likes to sort of play little one twos and sort of walk the ball into the box and. Um, one thing here in South Africa is players are very technically gifted, so they like to beat players in a one-on-one -on -one situation or um, give little one-twos and, and, and those types of little things, which I'm, I'm more than capable of doing, but well, not, not beating players with skill, but um, the, the one-two sort of thing. And, and it just, just never really happened for me, um, which, is, which is disappointing because I thought um, that, I, that I could have come to the Sundowns and... and and they, they had a good number nine, a Colombian striker, um, a couple of years before I arrived, and, and he seemed to score a lot of goals. Um, and I thought, I thought I could go in and sort of replicate that, and, and it never really happened for me, um, was, which is disappointing after um, wanting, wanting to move there. Um, and after, after being in, in the setup as well for for a couple of months, I sort of realised that I wasn't really going to be the player that um, the, how the coach wants me to play as well. A little bit like the the scenario with with uh, Ernie Merrick at the Phoenix. Um, I tried to adjust my game, but it didn't really um, get the best out of me. And and then I sat, found myself um, sitting a lot more in the stands than than in the squad. Well, let's jump back to to SuperSport, who you you first turned out for in South Africa because, um, you know, one of New Zealand's best goalkeepers, Michael Latting, played for Supersport for a, for a long, long time. Did you talk to Michael at all before heading to South Africa to get his opinion on things? Yeah, I had a, had a brief chat to, to Arts and, and said, look, uh, I, I actually didn't know at the time that he had played for Supersport, but I knew that he had played in South Africa. And I got in touch with him. I said, look, uh, I'm thinking about going to South Africa and I had an offer from, from Supersport. And he said, oh, that's the club I was at. It's a brilliant club. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's like a, it's a big club, but for the, there's not too many people involved with the club. So there's a lot of people doing like multiple jobs. So it's quite, quite a tight knit family. Um, it's been very successful in, in winning trophies, um, and and I sort of fit in um, straight away there. Um, involved myself with some dancing and singing in the change rooms before games. Um, definitely don't have the, the South African dancing technique or the voice for singing, but uh, I thought I'd give it a go. And I think that's what sort of helped me, help the players accept me um, a lot, like quite quickly as well. Um, and I had a couple of good, like, understanding with a couple of players on the pitch there, which allowed me to, to really do well. And the, the African Champions League run, is that the first season or the second season that you were at Supersport? Uh, that was in the second season. Um, so there's like the Champions League and then there's the Confederation Cup, which is like the Europa League and the, and the Champions League. So the Confederation Cup is what, what we had the good run with, with Supersport and we made it all the way to the final. Um, I had a really good campaign there. We got the top goal scorer and I got into the top top five um, best oh, I got into the, the top five of the best top best five players in, in Africa um, award and then all of a sudden uh, they scrapped that award about two weeks out from from the ceremony they said uh, there's a little bit of controversy going on here so we're actually not having this award anymore oh, wow. um, because I was potentially going to win it and everyone was saying it. how can this guy win it he's not African sort of thing um, but some of the places we went there and, and uh, traveling around Africa was oh, it was eye opening. Eh? Well, well, yeah, I've got I've written them down somewhere. So apologies, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and find where I've where I've written it. But yeah, so I've got I've got games in Congo, Guinea, Gabon, Tunisia, and Zambia. Like those are places that like, we talk about in this region. We talk about Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands as places you kind of are, are, yeah. are out there. What's yeah. what's it like playing there in those sort of places? Yeah, those those places are very very sort of similar to, to some of those island nations, and um, but again, they love their football. So like the fans will be like, it's a little bit like when you play the Solomon Islands. They got people like hanging off the trees and on top of the stadiums and and that sort of stuff. Like they just love their football. Like you're tr going in the bus to training, they're throwing stuff at the bus, or they're like excited to to see you. So 
um, some really good experience there. Um, the only thing is, like, some of the food in those places is just shocking, right? Like, <laughs> like, literally, there's a couple of countries that you go to and you're just like, oh, I'll have the water and I'll have the bread with peanut butter on it, please. Like, you're biting into a chicken, you don't know if it's chicken or fish or... <laughs> Und undisclosed meat. Yes. Bat. Yeah, I, I didn't want to say it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you, and, and you, you, you joined at um, you joined at SuperSport by Michael Boxall um, as well. I think he finished the season with the Phoenix and then linked up with you in South Africa. So that must have been good, I guess, having a, a teammate and someone that you played with. Well, he was in the twenties in two thousand and seven. Was in the Olympic team as well. Um, yeah. That must have been been good for you to have that support. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it was easier for for Boxy to settle. Um, because I'd been there for, for six months prior as well. So we, I, like, I helped him find a place to live, which was just around the corner from us. Um, obviously, he had Libby moved there as well. So um, really good to have a, a familiar face. And yeah, we've, we've played a lot of our football together. Um, won our first um, trophy together at Super Sport, um, room together a lot. And um, yeah, I have some really good memories of boxing. One of the uh, times, I'm just going to jump over your South African timeline here. I'm going to go into your Memelodi sundowns uh, period. Um, one of the times you made headlines uh, across South African media was when they announced you as injured and then you went on Twitter and said, uh, no, not, not injured, um, yeah. sort of made the point of calling them out on it. Um, what was going on behind the scenes there? Yeah, so... Um Every well, as they do with every game, they they put the players listed that, that are injured on on social media, um, just so I guess the fans can know and and everyone else can know. And, and it's, I'd obviously been out of the squad for for a while, um, and it was on the the day of a game. I think it was the day of a game, yeah. And they they posted players injured, um, blah blah blah, all the players, and they had Jeremy Brocky, and I was like. No, <laughs> I was training this morning. So I rang the social media guy and I said, "Look, mate, why have you just posted that I'm injured? I'm not. I'm not injured. Like I'm, I'm training. I'm healthy. I just didn't get selected in the squad." He goes, "Oh, really? Oh, um, let me just check with the physio and and the doctor, and I'll get back to you." I said, "Okay, no problem." So I, I rang back 15 minutes later. I said, "Did you check with him?" He goes, "Yeah, no. He said you weren't injured." I go, "Okay. So why is it still on social media that I am injured?" I go, "Can you take it off, please?" And he goes, "Yeah." Just give me two minutes, I'll take it off. Ten minutes later, still on there. I rung him back and I said, if you don't take it off, I'm going to put on there that I'm not injured. He goes, no, 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 don't do that, don't do that. I'm taking it off right now. And I waited another half an hour and then, like, I thought, no. This is looking bad on me because at that time I was also trying to, to move away on loan. So I was like, I don't want clubs thinking that I'm injured when yeah. I'm not injured and then they questions get asked, so I just went. Uh, breaking your uh, breaking or something like that. Not injured, <laughs> and then that obviously blew up. Um, the coach rang me and the like general manager, and he, he said they actually rang me and apologised and said we're not really sure why he sort of kept it on there. I'm like, okay, uh, well, I'll, I'll accept your apology, but it's out there now, and I gave them plenty of time to to remove it. <laughs> So what do you think actually happened there? Do you think they were deliberately trying to well, make a point? I really don't know because, like, I have a really good relationship with the physios and, and stuff as well. And they said they did not – because they are the ones that obviously give the name um, to, the, to the social media guy. And he actually sent me the, the, the message, like, screenshot of the messages that he was sending to, to the social media guy. And my name was nowhere near it. So – I don't know, maybe the, the social media guy may, maybe had something else going on. Thought I'm going to add his name here. <laughs> bizarre, bizarre. Yeah. It wasn't um, the first time that you, you jumped, or well, that you jumped kind of headlines around social media as well. Because I think when you were back at Supersport, there was kind of like some like a race kind of an issue popped up where a couple of journalists um, indicated I've got I've got it written down here as well. You and I think your your frontman teammate um, White Boy Onslaught was the the term that was used, and Boxy called them out. Uh, Michael Box will call them out on social media as well about journalism in 2016 that this is still an issue. Yeah, I know. I think it said, like, where do they come from? How do they, like, run so fast and stuff like that? That was after our cup final when when uh, we beat Orlando Pirates in the final. So, yeah, 
that was uh <laughs> we've got a whatsapp group called onslaught <laughs> <laughs> amazing um what one of the other um headlines that caught my eye or headlines or, or stories out of your time at uh memelodi was when usain bolt came and trained with the the team uh how long was he there for and what was that like yeah that was definitely just like a big publicity stunt i think in the in the weeks sort of leading up to it um the the media guy at our club had sort of leaked a couple of little articles or a little put a little fishing line out there that um there was a there was a superstar that obviously at the time bolt was was uh, wanting to try his hand at football as well um and bolt being a puma um role model our club was sponsored by puma so they sort of got together and, and did a little bit of a PR stunt. Bolt was actually here for an athletics event, like a kids athletics event, but they they got him in and, and said that was our, uh, our latest signing. And uh, he trained with us for uh, for a day. He came in and, and spent the morning training with us. Could he, and, could he play? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was quick. It was <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, uh, I think we we uh, we went easy on him, and I think he scored a couple of goals for the cameras in the small side of games. Um, it's it's probably it's probably like me trying to say that I want to start being a professional sprinter right now. <laughs> <laughs> never say never, Brox. Yeah, true. <laughs> speaking of speaking of your running, you recently took part in a uh, a twenty four hour. Uh, running challenge where you think you had to run 2k every hour on the hour how did you how did that go yeah look i was pretty confident going into it so obviously with the lockdown and all um there's a group of, of people here in south africa that were just trying to promote a bit of stay at home stay, stay healthy stay active um and they decided to do a 24-hour running challenge where you run 2k every hour on the hour for 24 hours obviously and um I'm sort of thinking that, like, so they done it the first weekend, and then I thought I'm going to get involved with this. Like, two two kilometers, I can run two k. Um, the they say the the middle of the night, that twelve a.m. to four a.m. shift is a absolute <laughs> graveyard. I thought oh, if I can get through that, then I'll probably be all right. And it was probably about three a.m. So it started at six. It was probably about three a.m. where I thought. Oh, this is yeah. not starting to feel too nice, yeah. And oh, I guess well, there's probably only about maybe 16, 16 k, which is not actually that much. But it's the running the two k in your backyard on concrete, and then so I was I was maybe doing that in about in around fifteen minutes. So I wasn't putting in a shift, but I was I was I was moving a little bit. And then it's the going and sitting down for forty five minutes, and then getting up to go again. And at about three a.m., I thought. This is not nice. So 3 a.m. I put in a three and a half k shift, and I thought I'm going to sleep for for a couple of hours. Yeah, and I went, cool. went and slept for a couple of hours. Got up in the morning, refreshed after about an hour and a half sleep. Started going again, and then it got to about one 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 p.m. in in the afternoon. So there's five hours left. I thought oh, five hours. I've got to I've got to finish it. I've got to like, and I went out to try and go again and i just could not move <laughs> my body was just like i tried to move and like the neighbors next door were like keeping an eye on me and they're like nah so i, I ran for about i don't know 15 seconds and i came inside and sat on the couch i said dan i am done <laughs> but like so i ended up running about 30 32 k um so i'm still recovering now but like the, there's people in the group that are what I understood afterwards is most of these guys run like marathons and comrades and, and all those types of things. So these are guys that are actually run every single day. Um, but there's people in the in the group that were running seven over seven meters in their apartment. So there and back, six thousand meters, like just crazy ridiculous. Um, but we managed to what sort of speed? Show. What sort of speed were you running the two kilometers in? Um, so I started off about 14 minutes uh, for the for the 2k okay. and then no, i pushed it probably went out to about 17 or 18 and that's when i that's yeah. when i called it, <laughs> it 
but we raised um, for like a couple of local charities here and that are that are really struggling during this lockdown. Um, a company donated ten thousand nappies to to a, like a, a like a Voices of Angels thing, and we got a super, couple of supermarkets involved that have donated a lot of food, and we raised over like six thousand New Zealand dollars as well. Um, so I was for for a good cause. Um, gutted I couldn't couldn't finish my my stint, but uh, I gave it a good effort. <laughs> Brooks, um, just take the focus to off field uh, for a little bit. Um, you got three young kids. Um, how do you find the work life balance of being a professional footballer in South Africa? Is it? I imagine you get quite a lot of time with the family. And then, if you could talk about um, what it's like now, because obviously you're not with the wife and kids, and for an extended period of time, how how difficult that is. Yeah, I think as a professional footballer, um, having a having a wife and, and kids, we are pretty lucky because um, we sort of train every day in the morning. Um, but you're normally home by about I don't know, midday, so then you get that whole afternoon period to, to spend time with them, read books, uh, pick them up from school, um, all those those little fun activities. Kick the ball in the backyard with my boy. Um, take my my daughter to the rollerblading olympics where she wins a gold medal every time um <laughs> and then obviously my my young youngest is, is seven months um uh, which is which is um fantastic as well um so yeah we do get a lot of time but also here in south africa um uh, the night before games uh, everyone goes and stays in a hotel even for home games um i think that's because um, some players can't be trusted to, to not go out and, and get on the drink night before games. So uh, when you're playing when you're playing three games a week, you're in a hotel for for four nights sometimes. So there is obviously a lot of lot of travelling as well. So my wife has a has a lot of the the, the parental duty for both of us um, at times as well. And I think touching on at the moment, um, like I've already mentioned, the family's back in Australia. Uh, we made that decision because it was. Uh, we felt it was safer and, and, and more secure for them back there. Um, it's been five weeks already without them, which is really, really hard, uh, especially like my, my little girl, is she's just starting to crawl now and sit up by herself. And so I'm missing all those little milestones that um, obviously my wife's sending me through the videos and we're on the FaceTime video chat and, and stuff like that, but it's not the same as being able to interact with them. Um, and you know, young kids, you you get on the FaceTime with them. They say hi, Dad, and then then they then they run run off to do something else, and and then they'll say bye, I love you at the end, sort of thing. So um, yeah. it's definitely definitely difficult to be not there with them. I think, especially my young boy as well. He loves loves kicking a ball around, um, so I'm not there to, to to help him do that. So, but we we know that it's it's obviously not a long term thing. But we hope that it. The world goes back to, to normal pretty soon, so we can all be back together as a family and um, sharing those precious moments together. Yeah, that, that's got to be one of the most frustrating parts about it, isn't it? You don't have a time frame to work with or a definitive date like we're all going to be back together in a month's time or six weeks. We don't know how long this is going to go. So that that must be really hard not having that sort of certainty around anything. Yeah, absolutely. And and what makes it more difficult is we don't know what's happening with our league as well. We've still got six games left in the season. Um, the lockdown is obviously now until until April, but then you've got to at least when the lockdown gets downgraded or, or eases off, you've still got to put in a couple more weeks of, of training on the pitch before the season can get up and running again. So you, there's not really any date for us right now where I can say, OK, I'm going to be back with my family on the 15th of May, which is definitely not going to happen, <laughs> or like the 30th of June, or like don't really know. And my, my wife messaged me the other day and she said, I forgot to tell you what Oscar, my little boy, said. She said, um, do you like living here in Australia? And he said, yeah, I love it here, like with the beach and stuff like that. And and he, and he she said, oh, do you want to stay living here? She said, I will only stay living here if daddy can come. But if daddy can't come, then I want to move back to South Africa. So like okay. things like that are pretty, pretty heartbreaking. Yeah. yeah. Um, and your your wife Jess, um, she's effectively been pregnant the whole time you you've been in South Africa. Have I got that right? Because I understand that um, she was also a surrogate as well. She got you had your three kids, but she also acted as a, a surrogate for one of your friends. Was was that a tough decision? To I mean. 
yeah, how do you how do you come to that decision, and and was it an easy one for you to make? Yeah, I'll start off by saying it definitely wasn't um, easy to start with. I think um, it came about um, after my boy was maybe about one years old, so he just we sort of just got out of that like baby stage. It starting go started going back out for like dinners as a couple and and um, having a little bit of ind- independent time. And, um, so my my wife's friend she posted on on Facebook. And it was like a bit of a sad um, like post. And um, my, my wife obviously grew up with this this girl her whole life. Went to school with her, and she said, "Oh, this is not really like her." So she was private messaging her, sort of um, what's going on. Uh, um, and my wife's friend she had um, cystic fibrosis, so she couldn't physically carry um, a baby. Like her, her eggs and all that were uh, fine. The husband's um, all, all good as well, um, but she can't physically carry the baby. And my wife said to her, "Oh, oh and so the sad post was they were they were close to having a surrogacy agreement, but um, it, it fell through at the last minute." So. That's sort of what, and my wife said, "Oh, maybe I can, I can have the baby for you. I'll speak to my husband." But what, oh. she's obviously offered that before, but but with no like guarantees, sort of thing. And Jess came to me and sort of explained the situation. I was like, "No, I'm not. No, but like you're not getting pregnant again. Like we've had all the days in Mauritius where you you can't drink alcohol. I'm sitting sitting there having a drink by myself, or you're having a mocktail. Like we've just like got to start to get our own life back together." She said, okay, no, pro- no problem, I understand. And then maybe about four or five months later, she sort of brought the situation up again. Um, she didn't blackmail me, but she sent me a, a video of um, like a, a video on cystic fibrosis, which helped me understand a little bit more about it. And I thought, okay, let's, let's, let's give it a go. Like, let's try. There was a lot of like process leading up to it. We had to do individually count like two hour individual counseling meetings and then as a couple two hours and then all four of us so the my wife and i and the, the two couples another two hours so there was a lot of like processes and the counselor was the one that sort of decided at the end of the day if we're suitable to um go through with it or not and um, all the boxes got ticked uh, my wife flew back so she had to go on a lot of like medication and stuff to make sure she was all good to and fit to carry the baby. So she got injected with the she flew back to Australia, got injected with the the, the sperm and the eggs, <laughs> and uh, started started growing the baby. And um, pre- pretty much felt like it. Sometimes it takes a couple of times to get pregnant. Sometimes it just doesn't happen. And she felt pregnant straight away. As my wife is very good at. Um, carrying and making babies and, and delivering them and um so so the journey was was underway and it was like fantastic feeling knowing that you were going to be giving because we have our own kids obviously giving being able to give a, a child to um a couple that would love kids but can't physically have one themselves and um so that all good happy exciting um but then it's i think about 18 weeks, Jess was due to fly back at, to Australia, 20 weeks, going to have the scan, see what the sex is so they can start making plans. They're all exciting. And, and my wife's friend, Beck, the mother, mother-to-be, um, got, got sick, which is also quite quite natural and, and happens quite a lot uh, when, when you're dealing with cystic fibrosis. It's normally just a case of going into the hospital, getting the right medication, and then you're out again. And uh, she started to sort of get worse every day. And uh, like I said, that was about 18 weeks. And then uh, we got a phone call from the, the husband, the dad to be sort of saying, oh, do you mind going and uh, getting a test to find out what the sex is there in South Africa? Because I don't think my wife's going to make it. And I was like, oh, God, this is not like a nice like, situation to sort of be in. And again, this was a situation that had been talked about and the council, like with the counselors and stuff, because cystic fibrosis at, at some stage you do, um, unfortunately, um, fall to, yeah. But um, so, but she still had like 10 years life expect- expectancy. So we thought, no, all good. And then my wife changed her flight. So she got the, the sex of the baby, they found out that it was going to be a boy. So then that was all exciting for them. 
wife changed her flights to fly back a little bit earlier to just in case on the off chance she didn't happen to make it and then my wife was on her way to the airport here in South Africa and I, after about five minutes I uh, got a message from her saying that um, Beck, the mum to be had just passed away so that was like as much as it was a really happy story there was a uh, really sad um, outcome to that and um, now I've just had some photos and videos Jess is obviously back there now uh, where, the, where the dad and the boy is two years old going strong he's a super absolute super dad raised so much awareness um, for cystic fibrosis there in Australia and um, yeah but real mixed emotions and feelings throughout that journey yeah I can imagine what an incredible story your wife sounds amazing so yeah, she, <laughs> very <laughs> um Okay, well, um, so where are you at now, Brox? Um, you're on loan at Maritzburg United. Um, Maritzburg, yeah. You know, without being rude, you're, you're coming towards the end. Um, you might have a couple of years, maybe two, three years, who knows? Um, but what are your goals at this point? What are you looking to achieve at this point in your career? Yeah, so um, yeah, I'm coming to the end of my loan deal here in, in Maritzburg. I still have an option here. Um, with sundowns that can well, I have two one-year options that can can be extended by sundowns and they have to tell me um, by the end of May so I'm sort of just hanging around waiting for for that date to, to come and pass and, and and see what sort of happens there I guess with the with the virus going around at the moment and, and football on hold it's it's a little bit uncertain times really especially um, in, in the football world so um, yeah, it's a little bit tense moments for the for the next six weeks, um, just hanging around waiting. Uh, but I've started a couple of little football schools here in South Africa, um, which is which is going really well um, with with younger kids. They seem to like it, and um, it's doing well. I'm a, I'm quite passionate about coaching as well, so I wouldn't mind going down that route. I don't think I would be a, a head coach at a like a professional club. I, I like to stay and the youth and sort of get that buzz off seeing kids develop and, and go on to achieve things. Um, so that's sort of where I'm like leaning and heading towards at the moment. Um, but I'd like to still think I can play for a, for a couple more years yet and get a couple more paychecks. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk, um, let's talk all whites then in, in your all whites career. Cause you, you're one of the few players that's kind of spanned three um three coaches so you started out with with ricky way back in 2006 went through i think two cycles there anthony hudson you went through that cycle as well and then you, i think you played for fritz in fritz's first game over in spain against canada and then um you know he, he moved and then danny's come in now um and missed you missed out on the the first squad for the europe games and then i, I, I don't know i imagine you might have been in his thinking for for the games in march for that window um where does the international stuff so is there still a passion to, to play? Yeah, I've had conversations with Danny. Um, obviously, um, open and honest conversations. I've said to him, um, look, I've, I've not hung up my boots from, from an international point of view, but I don't expect to be um, to be called in just because of, I've been there for so many years. And uh, I said, Let, let's just keep an open and honest conversation. He called me the other about a week ago just to see how I was. Um, didn't really, couldn't really give us much information on, on, on future plans, obviously, like we said, with the football on hold. Um, but there's some good young boys coming through in New Zealand now. Uh, and obviously, you've got Chris Wood leaving the line. So um, while, while I'm, I'm still still available, I know that my time um, in, the, in the national team probably will be coming to an end um, soon. But he, Danny, look, Danny said, I, I'm not going to guarantee you a place, but um, he, I could could get called in for for, for games as a as an experienced head to, to guide the younger shoulders, um, like Hudson said. But um, <laughs> and, and I sort of said, look, any role that you need me to play, whether that's coming into a squad like that to give some advice or to come in to, to play games, um, I'm available. And he and he said, uh, let's just let's just take it as it comes. Good stuff. Well, closing in on uh, two hours. Um, Shay, how's our list looking? Is there anything we need to tick off uh, before we let Jeremy get back to it? Yeah, we've, prob it 
we've we've probably just glazed over your super early years in Nelson because you're a bit of a teenage prodigy um, coming out of there and had to move away from the region to get that National League experience. Tasman United's website says that you are a club advisor. Is that still a valid job title? And you mentioned coaching, so would you ever consider maybe coming back and uh, and taking the reins of, of a Nelson-based National League entity? Oh, that could be that could be that could be something, eh? Club advisor, are they doing well or or struggling at the moment? No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, I think they just put my, wanted to use my name as because I had come from the region and I've you know, got a little bit of affiliation there. My dad was on the board early on, um, and the and the sets up and stuff like that. So um, I'm their I'm their their first member. I've got their number number one membership. Um, so I've, I've still got links, and obviously uh, Nelson. Growing up in Nelson was a uh, I've got some good memories from there. So I'd like to keep in touch with that club, and who knows, I could have a little swan song <laughs> with the captain's arm band in the middle yeah. of midfield, spraying, spraying diags for Tasman United. <laughs> I, can, I can see the South African journos. The headlines. The headlines are going to be out tomorrow, Brox. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Hey, um, well, well, you've helped us out, Brox, by giving us two hours of your time. So if there's any Between Two Beers listeners out there on Twitter, why don't you go give Brox a follow? Because he's close to 100,000 uh, Twitter f- followers. So what are you at, 99,000? You know, I think we can get, I think the Between Two Beers audience can get you over the edge. Yeah, I reckon we can do that too. And maybe if, if we can get over the edge, then I'll, I'll send you guys a jersey to give away on one of your shows. Stop wow. it. Whoa. Look at Whoa. this guy. Killing it. Um, that's been uh, Shay. Anything else? Are we wrapping this up. The only look, the only other one, and it's from an anonymous former teammate, has sort of asked. They've asked why your accent has changed so much over the years. That when you when you left when you left uh, the nights to go to Sydney, you sounded very much like a a mainlander from from the top of the South Island. Then when you're in the A League, you sounded like you're an Aussie. And now that you're in South Africa, you've you've picked up an accent there. What's going on? What's going on with the accents? Uh-huh. I've got a little bit of everything, don't I? <laughs> well, you think I'm bad? You should hear my daughter. Oh, she's got a little bit of everything as well. Oh, Stevie does a Stevie does a very good South African accent. If you've listened, if you ever get a chance, Brox, listen to a few episodes episodes in the back. I won't make him get it out now because it, it'll be horrendous. And if we do get any South African listeners, they'll be appalled by the effort. Okay, we'll keep that. Oh, it's, an absolute, it's an absolute pleasure having you on the show uh, tonight, Jeremy. <laughs> Oh, horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's been great, mate. Hey, thank you so much. Um, Jimmy Brocky, high profile between two beers, cracked, cracked big time. We're getting the big guns in. Um, thanks, mate. That's been awesome. Really enjoyed going through your career and uh, look forward to maybe catching up for a real life beer uh, when you're next in New Zealand. Sounds good. That's when I'll bring the shirt, boys. <laughs> okay. <Nice one. laughs> Good one. Cheers, Jeremy. Cheers, cheers.